Hey everybody, welcome to another live stream. Today we're going to be looking at Group C as part of this uh, series of World Cup group analysis in the build-up to the World Cup later this year. As I mentioned at the beginning of the last live stream, the first in the series where we covered Group H, I said that uh, all of this would be subject to change as well as the fact that uh, I want to get this out now because I kind of want to build towards the World Cup itself. Um, and, you know, even when this series is over, uh, which I expect to finish well before the World Cup itself starts, um, because once this video is complete and once it's uploaded, we're already a, a quarter of the way through with this series, uh, there's going to be other, there's going to be more World Cup videos coming up this year, of course, more. Um, Videos regarding certain teams. I just like the last World Cup cycle in 2018. I plan on making 32 separate videos doing team profiles. That was a big project. I plan to do the same here. Those vids will be anywhere between five to ten minutes long, talking about all 32 teams. One video dedicated for each. That will that series will start sometime in late August, September and wrap up maybe a couple weeks before the World Cup, then, you know, in between all of that, I'll be doing updated World Cup predictions like I did last cycle. Maybe once every month, month and a half, give updated predictions on how I see the tournament unfolding. That, um, when the draw came out last month, uh, I did such a live stream. Now we're approaching two months on. I may make an updated video sometime in June. Then you'll see another one maybe in August. And then a final video sometime in October or November. So, yeah, a lot of World Cup content. A lot of World Cup content. In this video, in this series, I decided to go and talk about the groups out of order. Just because there are some randomness in there. Um... I pretty much just choose whatever group on the fly that I want to go into. So last video, I started off with Group H. Today, we're talking about Group C. Group C, which contains Argentina, uh, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Poland. And without further ado, we might as well just go ahead and jump into it. So Group C. Now, this is one of the groups that, when it came out on paper, I thought, and to some extent still feel, uh, is relatively straightforward because I see one clear favorite to advance, one clear favorite to finish bottom, and then second and third really being a battle between uh, the two other teams. And while I still think there's a potential for a little bit of a surprise to happen in this group, I think this is one of the groups where that is least likely to happen. And this may be a group that ultimately finishes in just about all the positions we would normally expect them to, more or less. That being Argentina coming in first, Saudi Arabia in last, and take your pick between second and third between Poland and Mexico. Um, of all the eight groups, this might be one that once we get closer and closer to the tournament, I find to be one of the least difficult, if not the least difficult one to predict uh, or to make a call on uh, just because of the way that it's shaped up, right? But without further ado, I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to start with Argentina. So Argentina currently have the longest ongoing undefeated streak that's currently active in international football right now. They have gone 30 games now, dating back to 2019, without losing a single match. With Algeria and Morocco slipping up at the last Africa Cup of Nations, Argentina took that title, so to speak, earlier this year, and they don't look like they are slowing down anytime soon whatsoever. Looking at Argentina's record in World Cup qualifiers, 
They finished second with 39 points undefeated. Now, Brazil, who just in 2022 broke the all-time points record for a team in Common Bowl World Cup qualifiers, which was previously held by Argentina in the 2002 cycle, they got the lion's share of attention from this feat here. But when you go and look at the standings, Argentina didn't lose a single game as well. Their record was 11 wins, 6 draws, 0 losses. And this is actually the first time ever in any World Cup qualifying cycle in South America that you have two teams that finish without losing a single match. Argentina finished a full 11 points clear of Uruguay, a full 13 points of Ecuador, and 15 points clear of the playoff spot uh, team, which is Peru. Argentina drew their match on, at home against Brazil. FIFA is ordering them to play Brazil later this year in that second World Cup qualifier that got postponed. So technically there's a World Cup qualifying game in South America that has yet to be played, that FIFA has ordered to be played, which is going to count as an away game for Argentina against Brazil. But this is a remarkable achievement because this Argentine side finished only a couple, only a few points behind that 02 generation. And for all the attention Brazil has gotten with Tiche and their manager still across over two cycles being undefeated in South American qualifiers, Argentina is riding high right now. And coming off of winning their first major senior men's international trophy last summer, uh, breaking a 28 year spell of no of a title drought, you really get the feeling that. Argentina now has really come into their own and that this year really could be different where they are the real deal. And to be very honest with you, you look at back at previous Argentina sides between 2014 and 2018, even uh, that generation, which had made, um, which had made the latter stages of tournaments like semifinals and finals, but couldn't quite break through and win tournaments, those sides all had glaring weaknesses. But right now, Argentina, doing what they did, going into Brazil in their own neck of the woods last summer and actually beating Brazil in a Copa America final against the tide of history, Lino Messi getting his first trophy with his country, just the way that this team looks compared to where they were in 2018, which was a almost a disaster for them. They almost had a group stage exit. It really looks like Argentina has turned a new page. And I've said often that I think the moment of change for them came in that semifinal loss in the 2019 Copa America against Brazil, a, a match where I distinctly remember Argentina had outplayed Brazil in that game. Messi was furious afterwards. He thought there were a few officiating decisions that had unfairly gone against Argentina. And it was really from that moment on, after getting off to a really poor start in that competition, Argentina really seemed to have shifted into a higher gear. And once, once the qualifiers started in 2019-2020, they just never really looked back. And it's not surprising at all that a team like Brazil repeating what they did back in 2018 cycle, but I don't think a lot of people, myself included, really anticipated Argentina to be this dominant, this dominant in the qualifiers this time around. So it begs the question, is Argentina the real deal heading into this World Cup? And you know, I got to keep it honest, I think they are. There's an argument that um, I've seen other YouTubers make um, or, or just fans in general, that there's an overall skepticism because they don't know how Argentina would look against European opposition. But the only response I would have to that is, what more do you want to see? Because South American World Cup qualifiers are, for my money, the toughest in the world. Argentina doesn't have to play San Marino and Andorra day in and day out and get 12 free points from that. They don't play the Faroe Islands. They don't play Gibraltar. 
the European countries really only have to deal with a couple other really big teams uh, to qualify. I think Argentina virtually sweeping this cycle and going undefeated is a huge statement. And there was a really provocative uh, opinion piece that I, I, I read when I was listening to uh, Filippo Silva, a tactical manager, his YouTube channel. He was talking about Argentina. And I think he was doing his like World Cup early analysis videos. And he made a he made a point that I did not consider at first, but the more I think about it, the more I actually buy, which is that this might be Argentina's best team since the late eighties. With maybe a possible exception of the 05, 06 Argentina team that had guys like like Juan Pablo Sorin, uh, Raquel May, Cambiaso, uh, a younger Carlos Tevez. This might be their best team since the 80s. And I do think that this is already a better team than the one who made those three finals between 2014 and 2016. Because like I said, even back then, the World Cup in Brazil, those two Copa America finals, Argentina still showed signs of being an incomplete team. They were not a high-scoring team at the World Cup in 2014. They actually entered that tournament with the expectation that they were going to score goals but have some weaknesses at the back. It turned out to be the opposite. You had guys like Mascarano and De Michaelis really step up, and Argentina were solid defensively, but they squeezed by their games with 1-0 victories all in the knockout stages, won all their games in that World Cup by one goal margin before losing an extra time in the final to Germany. So it was the opposite. Then in 2015 and 2016, they started to look better and better, but they couldn't get past that sort of psychological hurdle of, of actually winning trophies. And they fell susceptible to that previous trend of coming up just short at the final stage. And after 2016 Copa America, when Messi left the first time and he temporarily, I think, announces it retirement, but then he came back, I saw how they were struggling in the qualifiers, how they were technically on the brink of elimination on the final match day against Ecuador in 2017. And Messi w went berserk, scored that hat trick, and they managed to squeeze through. I saw that, and then I saw the buildup throughout spring and early summer 2018 and many of you who've been around my channel for a while you may remember i was saying these guys are going to struggle when they get to to russia they might not even beat iceland and they didn't beat iceland and in the final group game against nigeria in that world cup they came razor close to having a, a first round exit it was really that 6-0 loss to Spain in that spring, in that friendly, that, that set the fire alarms off. And I thought, and I saw Jorge Sampaoli in all these press conferences. Uh, he was saying, like, Messi is the plan A, the plan B, and the plan C. And I was, look, I was looking at that, and I'm like, ooh, fam, that's, this is not a recipe for a deep tournament run. This is a recipe potentially for an early exit. And sometimes it must be said that how a team performs in qualifiers is not always indicative of how they're going to do at the World Cup. Case in point, Argentina, um, the Argentina team of 2002 who had the points record before Brazil broke it this cycle, they crashed out in the group stages in South Korea, Japan. So it's not always necessarily indicative of how, of how a team is going to do. But sometimes a team just gives you a really bad vibe based on how like the tournament preparation is going where they just don't look good. You know what I mean? I think this time is different. And sitting down, looking at the bracket, I'm going to jump into Argentina in a moment, talk about like players, recent form, et cetera. Um, but looking at the bracket, this is a group they should top. They should win all three games. Possibly they should win all three games without even conceding. They should come through a second round match against maybe Denmark or Peru. Maybe we'll see a rematch in the round of 16 if they come up against France, if France slips up in, in their group, because just like the last World Cup, Argentina and France are in adjacent groups again. 
I got to be honest with you. If they, if we get that matchup again, I think Argentina is going to kick ass. I think they're going to get revenge. Argentina would then be looking at a potential quarterfinal against the Netherlands, which is not a guarantee. It could be Senegal. It could be unlikely England if England slips up in their group. But I look at the path right now, look at because bracketology is not just a pseudoscience, it's real. Uh, there's a path for the semifinals. And if you look at all the the permutations and everything of all the powerhouse, all the big dog nations, Argentina has one of the I wouldn't say easier, but one of the more lenient pathways to a last four finish, where conceivably they could meet Brazil in the semifinals again. So they could meet Brazil again later this year in the semifinals, rather. Um, Going through the squads now. Let me me, me pull this up one sec. And in a moment here, I think we're going to see why things are finally starting to click for Argentina. Because, and this was something that, you know, uh, was something they struggled with for a long time, was crafting a team that's not centered around Messi. Not just a team that relies upon sort of like accentuating the best qualities of Messi, but setting the team up in where in which having Messi on it accentuates the qualities of the rest of the team itself, or other players stepping up. And it all goes back to the system. It goes back to tactics, the lineups. Uh, and I think Lino Scaloni, the young manager that he is, first ever time managing a national side, former player of Argentina, he's really got this right in a way that guys like like Batista and San Paoli, and I would say even Alejandro Sabella, they got wrong. Looking through here, going through the squad, look, it's a, it's a talented, talented squad. Every single player that I'm looking at here, the preliminary squad, the following 35 players, Wikipedia is your best friend, uh, were called up for the 2022 Finalissima against Italy, on June 1st, 2022. Every single player on this list here, except for one, two, two players, plays in the top five leagues. And then you have a bench that has players coming up from the Argentine Primera Division for top class clubs like River Plate and Boca Juniors. So just going through the squad that's been called up for next month's Finalissima against Italy. Uh, Pulling this up here. Messi, of course, that goes without saying. Lautaro Martinez, 19 goals for Argentina, 24 years old. Inter Milan, 37 caps to his name. Uh, You have Angel Correa, Atletico Madrid. Joaquin Correa for Inter Milan. Lucas Alario, Bayer Leverkusen just got disqualified for the Champions League a few days ago. Uh, Rodrigo De Pau, Atletico Madrid. Angel Di Mario, Leandro Paredes. Uh, Ezequiel Palacios, Christian Romero, one fourth. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look. Messi now has a support, supporting cast that he needs. Messi played a huge role in almost every single goal Argentina played back in the 2014 World Cup. Now, you see in, in qualifiers... Some of these games, Messi was not able to be called up due to pre, uh, club commitments, due to injuries. A lot of goal scorers, Argentina has, has stepped up in terms of having consistent, reliable goal scorers in the squad to call upon. And it's, it, it's worked like magic. It really has worked like magic. Giovanni Lo Celso. Forgot to mention him. Paulo Dybala, of course. Dybala, though, eh, he's kind of here or there for Argentina. He does, he's not really – he's a bit quiet. He's a bit quiet. But this is a team that I think is going to be a serious contender in Qatar this year. And I think that um, some that are weary or dismissive of their, their chances is because they haven't seen them all. We don't know how they're going to look against France or – 
or, or, or England or, or Germany or Spain. It's like, what do you want them to do, right? They play in South America. You want them to take a giant saw, saw Argentina, and then push it towards you can only you can only play what's in front of you. And like I said, like there's not an easy game in South America. Even the ones against Bolivia and Venezuela, they're not easy games. So when you have a team that historically pulls off something that nobody else has done before and go undefeated in what is arguably the toughest qualifying region in the world, I, I don't really see why it would be compelling when you have the likes of France and, and England and Spain who have to play against Kosovo and Georgia, you know? So, yeah, I, it's that kind of like argument I never really bought, to be honest. But here's the thing. You take into account what I just said. You take into account the fact of the bracket in front of them. You go through the roster. And this is a team, I think, actually now can actually win this tournament. And the more I think about what Tactical Manager said, go check out his channel. It's very good uh, for like a, 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 a tactical uh, scientific view of the game. Um, I, I, I kind of buy into the argument that this might be their best team since, since Diego Maradona's Argentina. This might be the best Argentina team in 30 plus years. And I think they what, – what's so interesting about Argentina, what's so interesting about them is that they entered this World Cup with more of a point to prove because after finally breaking through and winning a trophy last summer, this team is still playing like they're hungry. And a lot of the time when you actually finally win something, it can take pressure off or it can mount pressure. I don't think Argentina here is done. I think they want to go into Qatar this year. The goal, obviously, just like any cycle for Argentina, is going to be to win the World Cup. But now they have this sort of steam that's let out of the bag because this generation was under so much press pressure in the last decade to win a trophy. And they got close time and time again domestically uh, in Copa Americas and at the World Cup. Now that they've finally done it, it has completely shifted momentum even further in their, in, into their direction because they're coming in red hot. And you have to think that they're going to be intent on proving it on the world stage as well. So I don't uh, – one concern I had for Argentina when they won the Copa America was that it was actually going to decrease their chances of winning the World Cup because, okay, now they got their trophy, Messi – you know, he could just play in Qatar, and no matter where they finish, he'll just retire and they'll fly off into the sunset. There's no more pressure because they, they actually won. But we, I did not see that reflected in a drop-off in performances in World Cup qualifiers. By the time Argentina had won the Copa America, they were already in a comfortable position in the qualifiers. But, but after the Copa America, when most of the matches were played in late 2021 – they still managed to put 12 games in a row consistently going undefeated, which shows to me they're not done yet. And they play against Italy, the European champions, who quite incredibly didn't make it to the World Cup again, uh, in next month's friendly, the finalissima between you know the champions of South America, the champions of Europe. And I think that's a, that's a match on paper. I think number one, Good idea because it's a good preparation for the World Cup. You're playing against another top class team. Um, th that's a game on paper. I think they're favorites to win and continue their unbeaten streak. We could see a scenario where Argentina actually goes into Qatar this year and they're still undefeated. They still have the longest ongoing un unbeaten streak in the world. And who knows by that time, depending on the matches they schedule and friendlies to prep for the World Cup, they might pass. Uh, Italy's 37 game record for the all time undefeated streak in international football. But let's not get too far ahead there. The point I'm trying to make here is Argentina is not showing any signs yet of slowing down. I was thinking they might have 
once they won Copa America because the, the long odyssey would have been finally over. And then they can just do what they need to do, qualify for the World Cup, even if it does not look convincing, and then we'll see what happens. But no, that has not been the case. It's not been the case. And I look at Argentina and I see a team that wants more. They want more. I can't make jokes about them anymore. Uh, them in Brazil, by far and away, are the world's best chance of taking that crown away from the European countries. And because of the way the bracket's set up and because of the way that if you actually outline, look at Brazil's path to the final, it's substantially more doable, substantially less less difficult. Argentina might be one of the three, maybe four favorites to win the whole thing. Because of that, to give you a very specific prediction, I think they're going to make at least the semifinals. And I think the way they look right now, if they don't make it to the last four, it's a complete failure. It's a total failure. Let alone a group stage exit or a round of 16. But even if they go out in the quarterfinals and they lose to the Netherlands, I think it's a failure. Because I look at a side like the Netherlands now, I don't see anything particularly special. I don't want to jump too deep into that. But they have to make the last four. Because of the way the bracket's set up, they have to make the last four. Now, how special would it be if in addition to winning the Copa America, they win the World Cup? Now Messi, then Messi can say, all right, all you haters who hated on me in my 16-year-long career with my country so that I can't be in the conversation with Pele and Maradona because I never won anything. Well, here you go. I just won two trophies in the space of a year and a half. I won the World Cup and I won the Copa America, which is nothing, which is something that Pele and Maradona have both never done. Fun fact, by the way, Pele and Maradona never won the Copa America with Brazil and Argentina. They never, they, World Cup winners, but they never won the Copa America. For Messi to be able to say, I just did both back to back in one year. Now leave me the hell alone. I'm going to fly off into the sunset and retire, pass the torch on to the next generation of Argentina players. That would be a big statement. And I, I can tell you this right now, as relieved as Messi is that he finally has a trophy with Argentina, he wants that World Cup. Argentina's moaning for it, for that World Cup. So, Parasite in the comment section said something very important. No team has ever won a World Cup after the Copa America. That is true. In the 105-year history of the Copa America and the 90-year history of the World Cup, no team has ever won both. But sometimes historical trends are meant to be broken. Maybe Argentina can do that this year and make even more history. I'm paying attention to you, Argentina, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening now. You have, I'm listening. I know you're serious now. The jokes are over. The nicknames are over. And I, I still I go back to that semifinal loss in 2019 Copa America. That was the turning point. Argentina felt hard done by. They felt raw with that loss. And then for them to win a Copa America final in Brazil, which, by the way, you talk about history, you talk about historical trends being broken. Prior to last summer's Copa America final, Brazil had never lost. Brazil had never failed to win a Copa America that it hosted. Every time Brazil had hosted Copa America, they won it. And that was also Argentina's first competitive win over Brazil since 2005. It took Argentina 16 years in a competitive fixture, whether it's World Cup qualifiers it took them 16 years to beat Brazil again. Super classical, the Americas, and other friendly uh, fixtures, they don't count. That was a watershed moment. I look at things like that and I think, okay, that's a breakthrough. It's possibly a signal of the order being upended. And look, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the credit here has to go to Lino Scaloni. Scalonetta, as they call it, uh, he seems to 
have somehow gotten the best qualities out of this team. And now, and here's the key thing before I finish with Argentina and I move on to Saudi Arabia, because we're already 30 minutes into this live stream. I don't want this video to be longer than an hour and a half or so. Um, whenever Messi would line up for Argentina in the past, I think you guys noticed this as well. Whenever he lined up, you could tell he didn't he didn't really like it. You could you can tell he he always felt like he was under so much pressure. And you look at how Argentina did in the 2015 and 2016 Copa Americas. Messi, every time he lines up for Argentina, or at least every time he lined up for Argentina, it was always a chore. And that's not to say that, you know, he would he would rather not have represented his country, but rather he felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. Go back to that penalty shootout loss to Chile in Centenario. How much you want to bet? How much you want to bet he considers it one of the worst days of his life? He missed a penalty in that final, too. I remember when he missed his penalty in that shootout, in that final, he was he was like pale. He, he, he was ashen. His expression was just – you can go watch highlights of that, and he, he can't even – he can't even stay on the pitch for the rest of the shootout. He's like walking around, his head's in his shirt and everything. He feels like he just got hit over the head with a frying pan. He said he was going to retire from the national team after that, and he had to be talked out of it. I think that was uh, his professional career. He, If I were to sit down and talk to him and ask him, like, what was, what was the worst day of your career? I can't prove it, but I, I think he would say that was one of the and that was their third consecutive loss in, in, in three years. In three, no, 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 in two years, 2014, 2016, they played three finals in a row. Do you know how devastating that is? That's devastating. You lose three major finals in a row, in three years in a row, three summers in a row. That's taxing. That's got to take a toll on anybody. But now, now they've won something. They've won a trophy for the first time in a generation against their arch rivals in their arch rivals' backyard, finishing undefeated in the qualifiers. Argentina, the only team in that continent that can say now that Brazil was not did, did not better them. And I look at the whole dynamic Argentina has going on now. Messi is thriving with his national team. It's kind of funny. <laughs> It's kind of funny how football works this way because for most of Messi's career, it was a tale of two careers. It was a tale of long storied legendary success with his club, Barcelona, but struggle and frustration and resentment for the national team. Now it's the opposite. Now it's the opposite because now that he's left Barca, PSG has been far from stellar. PSG's been far from stellar. Messi, for my money, and Ronaldo, the two legends of our time, I don't personally think either one of them is going to win the Champions League ever again. Either one of them. They're in the waning, the, 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 the tail end of their careers in their mid and late 30s. Now the focus is shifting out to the national side. Our, he's had more success with Argentina in the last couple of years now that he's had with club success. Now the narrative has completely shifted and it would be very fitting for him to go off into the sunset possibly winning the World Cup because you have to think he's most likely going to retire after this World Cup. I just think it's funny because the thing that's followed him for most of his career, club success, national frustration, now the, it's been switched. It's, you can switch the two around. So that's why I really, all of that considering is really why I think Argentina is the real deal this time. I'm seeing a consistent set of good performances, sometimes dominant performances, and an ability to grind out games even when they don't look flashy. And this has allowed them to get that 30-game undefeated streak, which they could still hold on to heading into the World Cup this year. And I will be surprised if they don't make the last four. Surprised.
Anyway, moving on. We got Saudi Arabia. Only thing I'll, talk, I'll say about Saudi Arabia is don't underestimate them. A World Cup in Qatar is the closest this country, given how controversial it is politically, it's the closest this country is going to get to actually hosting a World Cup themselves. Being right next to Qatar, you'd have to think that Saudi Arabia are basically the second host nation. I would imagine ticket sales. I would imagine all their games being right next door. They'll have at least, if not a majority of fans, they'll have, they'll have very large crowd sizes, either in stadiums or outside at fan zones at like big screens and everything. Qatar and Saudi Arabia are two countries that are not on the best terms diplomatically, but it doesn't really matter because they're neighboring countries. And this being the first World Cup in the Middle East, there's a part of me that sort of superstitiously believes that the Middle Eastern countries are going to experience at least some kind of boost in performance as sort of like a de facto home advantage kind of thing. Saudi Arabia finished top of their World Cup qualifying group. They finished with the second best record in Asia. That's something to keep note of. They finished above Japan and Australia with 23 points, seven wins, two draws, one loss. That one loss came in a 2 0 loss, uh, a 2 0, uh, well, loss, <laughs> for lack of a better word, away to Japan. Uh, but they still managed to finish top of their group with two games to spare under manager Herb Renard, who has been known to have success as a manager with national teams in the past. Um, Ivory Coast and Zambia had come to mind. He also took Morocco to the World Cup in Russia in 2018. And for the most part, Saudi Arabia, in modern World Cup history, you know, they're sort of like a regular participant. They missed out in 2010 and 2014 before coming back in 2018. But you look at West Asia and you look at Arab football, Saudi Arabia is an AFC powerhouse. Historically speaking, they just are. They usually make it to the World Cup. Only made it past the first round once in 1994. Have yet to do so since then. Um, I think, though, that in their opening match with Argentina, it's going to be a little bit too much to ask. I don't rule out the possibility of a surprise second place finish altogether. I think especially if Mexico and Poland struggle in this World Cup, Saudi Arabia could be in position to capitalize on that. But I think that no matter what group Saudi Arabia were drawn into, because they have the makings of a, of a pot four caliber team, you wouldn't really favor them to come through no matter what. Um, I would not be surprised, though, however, if they were able to put in decent performances and maybe even manage to avoid finishing in last in this group. But a lot of it just depends. I think that opening match against Argentina, um, I expect that to be a loss. But here's the thing with Saudi Arabia is that it's good for them to get that match out of the way because that's the hardest part. Uh, I think they have substantially better chances with Poland and Mexico than they would with, with Argentina. It's even worse if they closed out the group against uh, Argentina. But with Saudi Arabia, I think you cannot look past them because of the, the venue of this tournament where it's taking place and the fact that on their best day, they might be a, you know, a top two, three side in Asia. Like I said, only Iran finished better than Saudi Arabia in, in the Asian qualifiers. Uh, and they end up placing comfortably ahead of, of Australia and Oman and uh, narrowly ahead of, of the Japanese. Going through their squad right now, Saudi Arabia is known for being uh, one of the rare national teams at World Cups that send almost exclusively domestic-based players. In fact... If you look at their roster on the Wikipedia page here that were called up for the qualifiers back in March, it's entirely 100% all players, every single one of them, not a single one outside of the Saudi league. 
You have guys that are playing for clubs like Al Nasser, Al Itihad, Al Hilal, uh, Al Ali, Al Fateh. So, as I mentioned in the last video uh, when I was talking about South Korea and Group H, that can be a little bit worrisome um, when you have national teams full of players that don't play among the best leagues in the world. A lot of the time that is indicative of just not having enough quality to really do something in a major tournament. But sometimes, you know, having a squad of domestic-based players, those players are with each other. Most days in the calendar year, they play in season or they play in international competitions in the AFC. Uh, it can create a sort of like familiarity or chemistry among core groups of players that are part of the same clubs. So sometimes it can come uh, to a team's benefit. But on a grand stage like the World Cup, when you're coming up against powerhouse nations, it's usually, it's usually considered a really big achievement when a, a squad of primarily, if not wholly, domestic players are able to get results. Um, but it is a talented squad. I can't knock on Saudi Arabia. I, I sure as hell cannot. They beat my Egypt team at the last World Cup in Russia. We don't speak about that, though. Uh, and a lot of the players on this squad, the bulk of which were part of that 2018 side in the last World Cup. You have Salman Al-Faraj, Salim al Dasari. Uh, I'm trying to see names here. Fahad Amulad, yeah, he was in the last World Cup. I remember him. Uh, Salah Al Sheri, he was as well. And then you have a bunch of youngsters here too, that uh, according to this sheet here, just got cap tied recently. So the names Al Dasari and Al Sheri and Fahad Amulad, they stick out as the veterans of the squad. Then you have like Salman Al Faraj, uh, Ali Al Hassan, Khalid Al Ghanam, Mohammed Kano. And you know what's really interesting here is Saudi clubs are pretty decent. I got to give credit where it's due. Saudi clubs, uh, it, it, certainly in Asian competitions, um, have been known to win champion leagues. Al Hilal. Al Hilal, the, the, the champions of Saudi Arabia, they've won two of the last three AFC Asian Cup, uh, Asian Champions Leagues. And Saudi clubs um, have made numerous appearances in Club World Cups, consequently, as Asian champions. I believe Al Hilal actually made the semifinals of the Club World Cup a couple of years ago. They finished in third or they finished in fourth. I can't remember. Um, but even though those clubs have a healthy share of foreign players, uh, certainly as far as the Asian game is concerned, Saudi Arabia has one of the stronger domestic leagues. And I think when you see a team that has primarily domestic players, it's usually indicative of a, a sense of pride going on where a team prides itself on having, they think that their, their league is good enough to produce players at a national level to be able to compete. In major tournaments i would not rule out the possibility of saudi arabia coming out of this group um but i think the likelihood of that happening is mostly contingent on uh the other sides underperforming not so much as, as saudi arabia uh overperforming and at the end of the day no matter wh where this world cup is being held i think saudi arabia would just not be favorites to come out of this group it's, it's a little bit too tall that, to ask now, if they can get a narrow, uh, a narrow defeat against Argentina, maybe losing by just a goal, they might be able to say what's up. Because you would expect on paper that to be a blowout, right? A 3-0, 4-0 loss to Argentina. Uh, and then it gets a little bit easier from there, but not very much. But here's the thing. As far as World Cups go, Saudi Arabia is uh, Asian... Uh, royalty. They are one of the big teams out of the continent. Uh, and they deserve to be here. They deserve to be here in terms of like results in qualifying, their talent. And I think they're very well coached too. Very well coached uh, with Herb Renard. So we'll see what they can do. 
should I move on now to Mexico? Does anyone else here have anything to add about Saudi Arabia? Anyone have anything else to add about Saudi Arabia? No? Anything? All right. Well, let's move on now. Ah, our neighbors and friends to the south. Mexico. All right. Let me pull this up here. Lots to say about Mexico. Hmm. All right. So Mexico. <laughs> the same question from Mexico for this World Cup as every other World Cup they enter. Is this going to be the year where that elusive Quinto Partido is finally achieved? Is it finally going to happen? Mexico being one of only two countries in the world. This is actually a very impressive stat. One of only two countries in the world to always make, always make it past the first round of a World Cup since 1994. The other country being Brazil. That means Mexico has the distinction uh, of holding uh, a record that no other, uh, no European country actually has. Not Germany, not France, not Spain or England or Italy or Portugal um, or the Netherlands. But it's also been their curse because they have been unable to break through that barrier of the second round. Seven consecutive times it's happened. And when I look at Mexico right now, how they were in the qualifiers, how they looked in the last Nations League and the last two Gold Cups, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if that's going to happen this year either. And I think a large part, and I don't like saying this, a large part of what has allowed the U.S. to have those successes in the Gold Cup and the Nations League um, is because I think Mexico has dithered a little bit. And Mexico has had some issues here and there, changing the old guard and bringing in young players. Uh, a lot of Mexican fans are not very happy with the direction under the team has gone under with Tata Martino. They think that he plays favorites with a lot of the older guys. Um, and his sort of in-game management has been subpar. This is things that I've heard Mexican fans say. This is not my own words. Mexico, despite not really, despite finishing second ultimately in the qualifiers on 28 points, a lot of their performances were not very convincing. A lot of them were very gritty, um, one nils and two ones. You know, getting points where they need to uh, to make the cut, but but not really putting in stellar performances. And my concern I have with Mexico that I've been keeping in the back of my mind is part of me thinks they might have a better chance of a group stage exit than they do of making the quarterfinals, which I hope is not true. Because every four years, when a World Cup rolls around, you know, in any other 47-month cycle, because, you know, four years, 48 months, in any other 47-month cycle, I don't want Mexico to win because I'm an American fan. But when the World Cup comes around, when the World Cup comes around, I want Mexico to have success because it looks good on the CONCACAF region. So in other words, it's kind of like, uh, how do I say this? Uh, <laughs> listen, baby, I know we've had some uh, struggles in our relationship, but you got to do me a favor. Just do well in the World Cup, okay? Okay? Don't, don't make our region look bad kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, the thing with Mexico is that I want to add, on the same token is 
they almost never look convincing heading into a World Cup. And then once they get to the World Cup, they over they, they they perform as well as they should. And you look at the last four qualifying cycles, 2010, well, 2006, 2010, 2014, and 2018. The only one where Mexico really looked like convincing was the 2018 cycle. I remember back in 2010, they all, they actually barely qualified for that World Cup. 2014, they were on the ropes, barely qualified for that World Cup. And then what happened when they got to the World Cup? In, well, in 2010, they beat France. And in 2014, they finished joint top of the group with Brazil on seven points. So, you know, Mexico, it's always a case of, like, they turn it up a, into a different gear when they get to the World Cup. It's kind of funny because Mexico plays its best football in World Cups. And that's allowed them to get victories over the likes of Germany, 2018, France in 2010, get that draw against Brazil in Brazil in 2014, a match they could have won. And in this group, coming up against the powerhouse this year being Argentina, you can already see the narrative build up because <clears throat> one team that a lot of Mexican fans I know that I interact with on the Liga Mex Reddit and on social media, if there's one team, one big powerhouse country that Mexico Mexican fans want like quote unquote revenge against, it's Argentina. They wanted our I knew Mexicans wanted Argentina before the World Cup draw came out. Well, here you go, El Tree. You got your wish. You got your wish. It happened. Let's see what you can do. You know, Argentina eliminated Mexico in both the 2006 and 2010 World Cups in the round of 16. Both. Both of their recent pain of not making it to Quinto Partido has come at the hands of the nation that is now in their group for this World Cup. And there was a poll that was done uh, on a post in the Liga Mex subreddit where it was like, who do you want to beat in the World Cup most? And the options in that were like Argentina, USA, Brazil. Argentina won the vote. A lot of Mexican fans want to get revenge against Argentina. Not just for those two round of 16 losses, but also because like, this is just what I heard. I'm not an authority. I'm not Mexican. I heard that there's like a sort of like cultural sporting rivalry because a lot of Mexicans feel like Argentina, Argentine people, they feel like Argentine people think they're better than everybody in Latin America. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. That's not my words. Um, so now Mexico's got what it's wanted. Now the question is, can they actually get something on Argentina? Because Argentina is kind of, it's kind of Mexico's boogeyman team. Because if you look even in, in, Recent games that these two countries have had against each other, like in friendlies, um, under Tata Martino, no less, Mexico's lost all of them. In fact, I think uh, there was a doubleheader friendly that happened back in 2019. It actually handed Tata Martino his first losses as Mexico manager. Mexico never has luck with Argentina. Uh, you, you can even go back to other competitions like Copa Americas whenever Mexico would be invited to Copa Americas in the 2000s. They lost a couple of times to Argentina uh, in those tournaments. So now it's an opportunity for them to say what's up. If you, if you want to claim another scalp like you, did, like you did with France and Germany and Brazil, this is a good opportunity to add another one to your list. And it's against a team that Mexico feels like it, it's just never been able to get the better of. <clears throat> and I, I really do think, I really do think Mexico will turn it up a notch against Argentina, which is why Mexican fans, I'm not worried about you in your in your second group game against Argentina. I'm not worried about how Mexico is going to perform against Argentina. I'm worried how Mexico is going to perform against Poland and Saudi Arabia. Because one thing that I've noticed as a U.S. fan is that Mexico is a team that 
plays to the level of their opponent. And this happens a lot of time in CONCACAF Gold Cups as well, where Mexico will struggle with the likes of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Guatemala in a recent friendly that ended nil-nil. Mexico will play up to the occasion or they'll play down to the occasion. And that opening match, as, as Got Any Black Ones said in the comment section, is that the Poland match is the most crucial. And that's the most important game in this, in this group right now. Because if that match produces a winner, the loser of that game is in big trouble because the loser has to deal with Argentina. And then the winner of that still has to play Saudi Arabia. You'd have to think on paper that's six points. So if this game ends in anything other than a draw, the loser of that game, whether it's Mexico or Poland, has to hope on Saudi Arabia to do them a favor. If Mexico loses to Poland, it might not even matter if Mexico can get a draw against Argentina at that point. Um, if Poland loses, Mexico is pretty much in the driver's seat at that point. So <clears throat> that's the most important game. That's the most important game. Which is why if you're a neutral, you want to root for a draw because you want this to go down to the wire. <laughs> but um, with Mexico here, I'm going to go through the squad. Give me a second. I just got to pull this up here. And look, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I want Mexico to advance. I, I hope Mexico breaks through and uh, makes it to the Quinto Partido because it's good for the CONCACAF region as a whole, I think. And also because they've been starving for it. They've just been... A lot of Mexican fans have grown up not knowing Mexico ever being in a quarterfinal of a World Cup because that's how long it's been. So I hope it happens, but I make predictions based on what I think is going to happen, not what I want to happen. Um, let me talk about Poland first, and then I'll do an overview, and then we'll do a more discussion with you guys tuning in, and then I'll give like a prediction for this group. Um, <clears throat> let me just pull this page here. Yeah, okay. So, the following players were called up for the friendly matches against Nigeria, Uruguay, Ecuador, and then for the 2022-2023 CONCACAF Nations League matches against Suriname and Jamaica. So I'm just going to read through here. Guillermo Ochoa in goal. Of course, I think he he's definitely going to be at the World Cup. Um my opinion, one of the best goalkeepers CONCACAF has ever produced. Alfredo Talavera, Rodolfo Cota, Cota, Carlos Acevedo. Okay, so yeah, familiar faces in the rest of the lineup here. Uh, Hector Moreno, Jesus Gallardo, uh, Cesar Montes, Johan Vasquez, Kevin Alvarez, Andres Guardado, Hector Herrera, Edson Alvarez, Uriel Antuna, uh, Luis Chavez, let me see. Okay, yeah. Raul Jimenez, Jesus Manuel Corona, Rodolfo Pizarro, Alexis Vega. A lot of these guys played in the last Gold Cup. Some of them did not. Where's Chaka Rodriguez? Has he been called up? Chaka been called up? Well, anyway. healthy blend of Liga Mix and European players here. I wonder, is Raul, is Raul Jimenez going to make the World Cup? Do you guys think Raul Jimenez is going to play in the World Cup? Because I hear he's not been the same ever since that skull fracture he had a couple years back. The problem with Mexico is that they struggle, they struggle to convert a lot of their chances. As someone in the comment section says that uh, this has resulted in 
uh, sort of inefficiency and goal scoring prowess. And it seems like Tata Martino, as I mentioned earlier, when he's struggling, I mean, one of his weaknesses as a manager is that he, he tends to pick favorites. It really just seems like Mexico has not really integrated the players that are, that are coming up through the under 20s and under 23s into the squad, at least not in a way that could be deemed as uh, bringing out the best in this team. And case in point, that's why they've struggled during several moments in qualifiers to break through, find the back of the net, really wear and tear and break teams down uh, the way that they should be doing. And one thing that concerns me about Mexico is, uh, as with most teams outside of Europe and South America this year, I don't know if they are going to have adequate preparation for the World Cup because as much as I love the CONCACAF Nations League, I have to wonder whether, as far as preparing for the World Cup is concerned, I have to wonder whether games against like Suriname and Jamaica is going to hurt them, whereas you have a team like Poland who's playing in the UEFA Nations League this year, and they're playing against Italy, the Netherlands, and Wales. You know what I'm saying? I just wonder if the these windows that are being used up for the Nations League would not be better served um, for Mexico to be scheduling friendlies against you know teams that are of much, much higher caliber. Having said that, <clears throat> Mexico has actually done a good job of getting in a decent number of friendlies here. They have games against Uruguay, Ecuador, Nigeria in June. So that's good. But it's really towards the end of this year that's a bit of a worry because who are they going to play in September? Who are they going to play in October? And I would imagine, although maybe somebody here who's Mexican can let me know, that for these Nations League games against Jamaica and Suriname, they might be fielding sort of a second string side. I don't know if Mexico is going to use uh, most of their A team or if they're going to rest up players and send in, you know, kind of like what they would do during an, an off year of a gold cup. I don't know how Mexico is really going to approach this, this nation's league because of that. But uh, I do worry whether or not CONCACAF as a whole, including Mexico is, um, going to be hurt by sort of squeezing in the Nations League before the World Cup instead of just waiting until next year, 2023. I love the Nations League, but maybe, I don't know, maybe we should have waited an, a whole year before bringing it back. Uh, <clears throat> Ghani Blackwood says Mexico called up 38 players for friendlies in the Nations League. I'm going to, oh, you know, I'm going to say this right now. Look, Mexico is the second best team in this group. I think I'm going to get to Poland in a moment. I think that it's good they managed to avoid a strong European team in this draw. I consider Poland more like a second string European side, a second tier European side. Um, and I do think Mexico could always rise to the occasion and give Argentina a very close game. But that first match is going to be crucial against Poland. <laughs> if Mexico loses that first game against Poland, they're going to need a lot of help. They're going to they're going to need a lot of help because um, you would think Poland should beat Saudi Arabia, and Mexico might find themselves in a situation where a loss to Poland might mean that they need six points to come through this group, which I think is very tall. Of it's a very tall task, um, with Argentina still to come after that game. Ha but here's the thing too: if Mexico wins that game against Poland, they're pretty much in the next round. Um, imagine they beat Poland, draw Argentina, then lose to Saudi Arabia, and they go out in the first round. Wow. Uh, Mexico. I'm going to close on Mexico before moving on to Poland. The last thing I want to say about Mexico is basically just this, which is that I consider Mexico to be one of the most underperforming national sides in the history of the sport. I think given the longstanding football and culture in the country, 
the strength of Liga MX compared to the rest of the CONCACAF region. Um, really the resources available and all the young players that Mexico has with success in the, the Olympics and, and youth tournaments, Mexico should be doing better than just going out in the round of 16 consistently. I don't know if I would go so far as to say that they should be competing for World Cups to win World Cups, but they it's sort of a statistical anomaly that they haven't gotten past the round of 16 yet. My concern for them, though, is that I don't know this year if they are a worse off than they were in the last World Cup cycle. And I kind of share the same skepticism that fans have towards Tata Martino. I, whenever I see him, he, he comes across to me as a manager who kind of just sits on his hands whenever the tide of a match is not going the way he wants. And looking at the way that Mexico were in the Nations League final and the Gold Cup final, there was no excuse to lose against an MLS based USA team in that gold cup. There was there was no excuse. I know Mexico were missing a couple players, but they sent a much stronger team to the gold cup than the US did. And I was shocked personally as a US fan that we actually managed to win that final because that's never really happened before where one of our countries sends like a B team or C team to the gold cup. Usually when that happens, the other team wins the tournament. That didn't happen this time. Uh, which might speak overall to the USA's depth now, but I don't know. It just feels like Mexico is clouded by a whole bunch of like internal issues that go back to the the uh, the uh, FMF, the Federation, and um, I'm a little bit weary that yes, this year that streak might end but it might end in the opposite direction where they don't make it past the first round. Having said all of that, Mexico always has a lot of question marks heading into a World Cup, and then they get to the World Cup, and they kick ass. So, Moving on now, we're going to talk about Poland. Let's talk about Poland now. Poland. Let me pull this up here. By the way, everybody, if you're just joining us now on the live stream, please leave a comment below when this video is uploaded. Give us your feedback in the chat. Like this video if you're enjoying it so far. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you know people in your life who are football fans and think that they would enjoy the channel, then please recommend this channel to them as well. I always appreciate having new people come to the channel, new followers. Um, <clears throat> let me pull up Poland's sheet here. Okay, so Poland finished second in their qualifying group behind England, um, advanced to the UEFA playoffs, where they received an automatic bye to the final phase due to the forfeiture of Russia following the, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and they defeated Sweden 2-0 at home to qualify for the World Cup. So they were the one team in the UEFA qualifiers in the playoffs who did not have to play two games to make it uh, due to political circumstances. Um, but their, their win over Sweden was a convincing performance under their new manager. Let me see here. Sorry. Give me one sec. This page is taking forever to load. Okay, there. Wait. There. Okay. In his first match in charge, Czeslav Minichkowicz, uh qualified Poland to the World Cup with relative ease in a dominant second half performance against Sweden, denying Sweden qualification to their World Cup. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty with Poland. And the uncertainty that I have is 
with the new manager, with the departure of the previous one, um, is there going to be enough time in place really to get Poland over the hurdle and actually make it past the first round of a World Cup for the first time since the 1980s? This will be Poland's fourth World Cup appearances this century, following three group stage exits in 2002, 2006, and 2018. 2018 being especially disappointing considering they entered that tournament among the seeded teams, but were eliminated before the final match day even took place. Poland has also had a tendency in all those three of those World Cups to start off really slowly, losing their games and then closing out when it's too late, winning their last group game. It's actually kind of funny because they were already eliminated in 2002 when they played that final match against the United States and they lost and they won that match. They were already eliminated in 2006 when they came up against Costa Rica and they won that match. Oh dear, those are two CONCACAF teams. That's ominous. And they were already eliminated when they played against Japan four years ago and they won that match. Poland has not had success really at the World Cup, not to their liking. And the goal for them this time, unlike Mexico, which is to get to the quarterfinals, the goal this time is to get past the first round. The goal this time is to actually just go one step further. And I think with a team like Poland, you look at their recent tournament performances in the European Championship and in the last World Cup, it really leaves a lot to be inspired. Um, that's why, for the most part, I haven't really been sold on them. And I'm somebody who, on this channel, I have called, have I've regularly called their bluff because I just don't, I don't really buy what they're selling. Ever since the end of Euro 2016, they just, they're just a side that's really struggled in the international football. They didn't do well in the, the Nations League. They had group stage exits at the last European Championship, which I predicted it happened. Uh, in the last World Cup, a group stage exit, I predicted it happened. The Nations League, I believe they got um, they got relegated in the first season, which happened, and then they got saved by the change in format. And I go back to Robert Lewandowski's own comments on the eve of Euro 2020 last summer when he even said that this team was not built to, to go very far in the, in the tournament, and they, they finished that competition bottom of their group following a really infamous loss against Slovakia, a game they should have won. Um, they just haven't been able to shine. They haven't been able to get it together. And I think that a lot of this is due to the fact that, you know, you compare po the Polish national team to Bayern Munich, and it's just a night and day difference in dynamic of what Robert Lewandowski, um, one of the great strikers of our generation, uh, has had to work with, has had to deal with. And I think that with Poland, I don't know why. I don't know very intimately the ins and outs of how the Polish FAs run. I don't know the ins and outs of the national team. Um, but I think a lot of it goes back to issues of the extra class of the domestic league in Poland has always struggled with, which is not really being well known to producing uh very strong teams that compete in European competition. Let alone forget Champions League. We're talking even Europa League. We're talking Conference League. The Polish League is very poor. And for that reason itself, when I pull up the, uh, the squad list here, most of the players that are called up for the national side for Poland ply their trade abroad in other leagues. Uh, some of which are in the top five leagues. You have some players in like the Danish and Turkish divisions. You have some players in Greece. Um, looking at the squad list here, there's only one, two, three, four, five players that have been called up in recent times that actually play in the extra Klasa. So the best Polish players don't play domestically. They play abroad. And the thing with Poland that I think that's really made them an unconvincing side in the last few years 
is just that it's sort of, how do I say? It's sort of like, it's like what Hungary has been experiencing the last few decades. Poland were a team in World Cup history that had pretty notable success in the early days of the World Cup. You go back to the 1970s. Well, not early, early days, but earlier days. You go back to the 1970s, 1980s. Poland had finished in, I believe, uh, two World Cup third place finishes. Uh, even before that, Poland had a long history in the World in the World Cup, being one of the best sides to come out of Eastern Europe, along with Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Uh, but the reason why they've been virtually silent on the world stage for the better part of 40 years now, I think, is because they've sort of gone the way of what of like a diminished status, similar to what Hungary and Czech the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia did. Um, and it's been because of that that it hasn't really given me any reason to think that this year will be different. And I still maintain, and this could be wrong, but this will be something we'll never know. I still think they got a little bit lucky that they only had to play one game to qualify for the World Cup in the playoffs. Because... It, when the draw came out, I thought Russia was going to beat them. They, they were supposed to play in Moscow in that first match, and then the winner of that played the winner of Sweden-Czech Republic. You had a team now with Poland who had an international break where they played against a team who had just come through 120 minutes a few days prior because that Sweden-Czech Republic game went to extra time. And then that team had to come through again on the road in Poland. So not only did Poland have to play only one game to qualify, but it was a home game too, which meant that Sweden or the Czechs, after coming through 120 minutes, especially the Czech Republic, have to play two games on the road. I think it tipped the balance in favor of Poland, if I'm being honest. And I, I still am of the belief that if, if Russia did not invade Ukraine, I think Russia would have beaten Poland. Because Russia looked stronger in the last round of qualifiers, and just my humble opinion, they looked stronger than Poland did. Russia finished very narrowly behind Croatia. Um, they actually missed out on direct qualification on the final match day because they lost narrowly on the road via an own goal, very unfortunate own goal that, Cro that Croatia had scored. And that sent them to the playoffs. Whereas in Poland's group, they struggled with Hungary. Um, they were given very tough games by Albania. Um, I think they did get a draw at home against England. But I think Poland were a side that really benefited from having to play only that one match in the, in the playoff round. And time and again when I've called their bluff in Nations League and in World Cup and in euros they keep giving me more and more reason to to keep doing that i don't think it's an impressive team i don't know very much about about cheslav Minikovic, the new manager maybe he is a, a guy who can i guess take poland that extra step and actually have them do something in a tournament but i don't know anything about him i don't know next to anything about him right um I go through here and I look at the squad. Pulling up the squad here. And just a lot of these guys are getting to be past their prime. They're getting to be past their prime. You have, you have guys in here that were part of that Euro 2012 Polish team back when they co-hosted the, the Euros with Ukraine. And I just don't know. I don't know very much about like a lot of the guys that are coming through and I have to wonder whether or not this will be a tournament where you see the likes of Robert Lewandowski and um, other guys like uh, like, uh, like like Kaminsky and Krychowiak having to really um, put the team on their backs yet again. I just don't know if that's going to be enough. Going through the squad list here, <clears throat> Wojciech Szczesny in goal, Poland's goalkeeper, plays for Juventus, 
32 years old. I think he made his international debut for Poland back in the Euro 2012. Um, fun fact, he actually got sent off in that opening match against Greece. He got a red card in that game. If Kamil Glick, 34 years old, Marcin Kaminski, 30, uh, Kamil Grosicki, 33, Gregorz Krychowiak, 32. Guy, you see what I'm saying? 31, 32, 33, 30 years old. It doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. It doesn't. And they do have, they do have, players who have made names for themselves um, that are younger, that have scored goals for Poland in, re in recent tournaments. Arkadiusz Milik, they still have Krzysztof P Piatek. Um, they have Karol Linetti. So it's not a team that is like starved of goal scoring talent. It's just that in major tournaments in recent years, they really haven't been able to get. They haven't been able to, to get things to click, and that's the problem with Poland. And it, of course, it's been reflected in the results. And until I see more of how they look in the Nations League this year, because that's the beauty of World Cup preparation, you get to see how they look in competitive games. I guess that's one good thing about the Nations League being held this year before the World Cup. You have competitive games to play, how Poland will look against other teams in League A, as well as in these friendly matches they schedule. They'll, they'll paint a better picture of sort of like where the chips are, right? So Poland really are a team in Europe that are always there or thereabouts. They'll usually make it to tournaments, but you don't really expect them to do very much when they get there. That's not to say they can't. That's not to say they can't. I think that it's just a side that has struggled to get the pieces together. Now, Samuel Starge in the comment section says, Poland are very talented, but they don't know how, they, how to use them. That's true. That's very true. But here's the thing, too. If they get things going... Mexico could be in trouble because I look at this roster. Poland's issue is not struggling to break teams down and, 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 and to find the back of the net. I just read six, seven, eight different goal scores. The thing is, as you alluded to, Samuel, they don't know how to, to get the team playing its best football. But if Mexico's struggles continue the way, the way they're going now, it might come down to individual moments of brilliance where a team like Poland that's been known to get goals where they need them versus a team again like Mexico who's really struggled to break teams down. You could have moments where a bit of brilliance off a set piece that meets the head of uh of Kanel Glick or uh of of uh, of uh, Robert Lewandowski could make all the difference. You can have a very lackluster team performance, but if it comes down to individual talent and those moments of uh sort of like improvised ingenuity, uh that can make all the difference, especially if you're dealing with two teams coming up against each other that are really struggling. And that's a concern I have for Mexico is <clears throat> if Mexico is in a position where they're, they're still struggling to score goals, who's going to be that guy? Who's going to be that guy that goes against the grain and out of nowhere can get them a goal from somewhere? Because sometimes... That's what makes the difference. I look at Mexico right now, I'm not sure. As is the case with, with Mexico in most World Cups, the reason why they usually do well enough to come past the first round is because of an overall uh, coalescing of, of a team effort. So Poland could play 
very uninspiring football and still have enough to come through if they if they if they have these go to guys that can get them these goals out of nowhere. And that's an advantage I think Poland has on Mexico. Mexico has World Cup at least recent World Cup pedigree of coming past the first round on their side over Poland, whereas Poland has really struggled to get anything going as far as deep runs in tournaments are concerned. So both teams here, the two teams that are likely to come in second and third in either order in this group, both of them have advantages over the other. With Poland, for now, I'm just still not buying what they're selling. I'm not here to give them the benefit of the doubt because they've never given me reason to pick against them. And every time I picked against them in the last few years, they keep vindicating that decision. Um, so in getting to like preliminary, like, well, premature, sorry, uh, predictions for this group, I think Argentina is going to finish top. I have Mexico versus Poland being a draw. I think it's going to be a draw. Um, and I think what's going to allow Mexico to squeeze past and get to the next round is that I actually see them getting a nil-nil draw against Argentina. I can see... Mexico, because of the occasion, because of the fact that, that Argentina is one of the sides they really wanted to play against, and because of the fact that Mexico tends to turn up a notch, I could see Mexico pulling a draw out of thin air against Argentina. I could see it happen. Not even out of thin air. I make it sound like it's. I make it sound like it's Argentina versus Gibraltar. It's not. Mexico has given me more reason to believe that they can get results than I think Poland has. And because of that, I could see a scenario where Mexico is actually in third place heading into the final match day from two draws against Poland and Argentina. Poland's in second because they beat Saudi Arabia. But then the order of the matches really plays into Mexico's favor. Mexico beats Saudi Arabia on the final match day. Argentina beats Poland. And Mexico pipping Poland to finish second. I feel kind of hesitant to pick Saudi Arabia to come in last with zero points. Not to come in last, but zero points. And maybe Saudi Arabia can actually take something from one of those games against Poland or Mexico. I mean, it wouldn't be a surprise. Poland has... Uh, finished last in their group in the last two World Cups they've played in. Um, but I could just see this coming down to the order in which these games are played being very important. And I'll tell you this right now. If, the, if Mexico is able to get something from Argentina, like a draw, I have a hard time seeing Argentina dropping points again to Poland. I don't see it happening. So Mexico playing Argentina second I think that's a very good thing um, because Argentina will be compelled to go into that last match getting a win. So you want, you want specific predictions for all these games. I'll give you specific predictions for all these games. I have Argentina beating Saudi Arabia 3-0. I have Mexico-Poland being a 1-1 draw. But with the storyline out of that being that Poland should have won the match, Poland being the better team, but Mexico getting the draw. I can see Argentina-Mexico being a nil-nil draw. Poland beating Saudi Arabia. High scoring, like, like, like 3-1 or 4-2, something like that. And then Mexico beating Saudi Arabia like 2-0 and then Argentina beating Poland 2-1. And that would actually make the group Argentina 7 points, Mexico 5 points, Poland 4 points, Saudi Arabia 0 points. That's what I have right now.
as far as an early prediction goes, I am worried about Mexico this year. But I still am putting faith in them to come in second. That's what I think. Funny enough, I don't feel confident in giving Saudi Arabia zero points here because it is a World Cup in the Middle East, and I could see them play spoiler in this group. Now imagine a scenario where, just like in 2018, Mexico actually gets help. On the final match day when they were losing 3-0 to Sweden, South Korea eliminated Germany, which allowed Mexico to come through the group. Imagine if we see a scenario where Mexico actually loses to Poland. And it's like, oh, man, they're in big trouble. They're going to go out. They're in huge trouble. They're basically already eliminated. And then they get a draw against Argentina and then beat Saudi Arabia. And that's four points. But they get help because Saudi Arabia beats Poland. Imagine that. And that allows Mexico to finish in second still. But anyway, look, <clears throat> I think this group is one of the least difficult ones to really predict and analyze. Because I think on paper it's quite straightforward. Um, that's how I feel. Basically, to wrap this up, I feel like Argentina can win the World Cup this year. I really am high on them this year. I think they're going to go far. I think they should make at least a last four appearance. It should be between Mexico and Poland for second. Saudi Arabia can cause some uh, headaches here and there, but they should come in last. Now, how far could each of these teams go? I think the limit for Saudi Arabia is, is the round of 16 at most. The limit for Poland, I think, is the round of 16 too because... I would not favor them. If they play against the, the winner of the, the group next to them, which is likely going to be France or Denmark, I would pick France or Denmark. So I think for Poland, also round of 16. Maybe quarters. Maybe quarters. Mexico can... But here's the thing about Mexico, too, man. If they come through this group in second and they play France, I don't know if, they're going to, if they could beat France. That's a problem right there. If they play Denmark... If France were to fall to the World Cup winner's curse and you have one of Denmark or Peru, then Mexico is in the conversation. So I think the limit for Mexico is quarterfinals. And I think the ceiling for Argentina is to win the whole bloody thing. Um, so any final thoughts you guys want to share Any about this group? What did I miss? What do you think I got wrong as far as like the analysis goes? Um, just your overall thoughts on the group in general. What do you think it's going to come down to? What are your predictions for this group? You know, just share that with me. Anyway, um, I'm going to end this stream in about two minutes. So, that's about an hour and a half, hour 36 minutes, hour, hour 37. Any closing thoughts you guys want to share? The next live stream will either be, I think it'll be Saturday or Sunday. I'll be talking about another group. 
I'm thinking of doing these kind of vids one every few days. One every few days. I feel rusty, though. I feel rusty because I've been away from YouTube for like a month. I feel rusty. I hope you guys liked my Nations League uh, League A prediction video yesterday. I brought the flags out again. I should be doing a League B prediction video with flags either tomorrow or the next day. I'm not sure yet. Um, so, yeah. What group will we be talking about in the next live stream World Cup video? I don't know yet. I kind of pick these at random, you know? Um, so, yeah, I pick them at random. Updated prediction for UEFA Nations League. Yeah, it'll come. When does it start? When does that start? Does it start in September or does it start next month? Are they doing the UEFA Nations League this this summer or this fall? June second. Oh boy. I gotta I gotta start on that. I, yeah, I'm going to do videos for them, too. When is the World Cup profile? Oh, yeah, team profiles for the World Cup. All 32 teams. Uh, expect that to start either in late August, September and to run until a couple weeks before the World Cup starts. It's a lot of videos. I did it in 2018. Um, that's going to be a series that lasts a couple of months. Anyway, any else you guys want to add? I think I'm going to end the live stream here. All right. Well, years ago, I, I decided to start doing live streams. Anyway, guys, thank you for joining me. I'm going to get going. I hope you have a good rest of your day. God willing, hopefully I'll see you guys soon. Until then, as always, have a good one. Much love. Peace out. Like the video if you like, if you enjoyed it. Subscribe, recommend it to other folks, and I'll see you guys around. Peace.